There are two events that a lot of Muslims are talking about. One is the upcoming solar eclipse on April 8th, and the other one is the red heifer sacrifice that the Temple Institute says they want to do a lot sooner than a lot of people think. Are these some kind of signs for the end times? Are these symbolic of anything? A lot of Muslims are talking about them and the fact that they're happening on very, very specific and strange days. So let's talk about what this might mean from an Islamic perspective. The April 8th solar eclipse is going to happen if it does happen when they say it will, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows for sure. If it does happen on the 8th, this will be the 29th of Ramadan, which very well could be the day following Laylatul Qadr and definitely will be in the last 10 days technically of Ramadan. A solar eclipse actually happened in the life of the Prophet A lot of people might be a bit surprised about the narrations about the Prophet and the eclipse that happened. That same day the eclipse happened, the son of the Prophet Ibrahim died, passed away that day. And so when the eclipse happened, people were saying that Allah is causing this eclipse because the son of the Prophet passed away. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said in response to this that the sun and the moon are two signs from Allah and that he does not cause them to eclipse for the life or the death of anyone, even the son of a Prophet. And when the eclipse first happened, the Prophet, peace be upon him, on one narration became fearful. He became scared that it might be the hour, it might be the day of judgment beginning. So he went to the masjid dragging his, his clothes and he told one sahabi to tell the people to announce that there's going to be a congregational prayer. And the Prophet peace be upon him prayed a very specific type of prayer that a lot of people don't talk about. The specific salah when there is an eclipse. I'll quickly go over the steps because the solar eclipse, if it does happen on April 8th, we should be prepared and follow the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. So the prayer is as follows. There is no adhan and no iqama. And it's recited out loud even though the eclipse usually takes place during the day. And it begins by Allahu Akbar like normal. The Prophet peace be upon him is narrated to in the first rak'ah, in the first unit of prayer, he recited for longer than anyone has ever stood in prayer before. That's what the Sahaba were saying. And the same thing is true for when he is bowing and for when he puts his head on the ground in prostration to Allah. So after you start with Allahu Akbar, you begin with Surah Al-Fatiha and then you read basically as much Quran as you can. It's supposed to be a very, very long unit of prayer. After you're done reciting, you say Allahu Akbar and go down to the bowing position like usual. Afterwards, you come up saying Sami Allahu Liman Hamida like normal and then you say Al-Fatiha again and you keep reciting again. After you finish reading Surah Al-Fatiha, you continue with more recitation of the Quran which should be long but should be shorter than the first time you recited. And then afterwards, you say Allahu Akbar and you go to bow again. After bowing, and you come up, Sami Allahu Liman Hamida, you go down into your first sajda and you do prostration twice. You prostrate to Allah twice like normal, then you get up and you do the same thing again. I should note that the prostrations and the bowing should be very long as well. One narration, Aisha radiallahu anha said that she had never prostrated to Allah that long before. So after you come back up, finishing the first rakah of prayer, you say Allahu Akbar again, you continue and you do the same thing. You recite Surah Al-Fatiha and more Quran again, which should be long but shorter than the last one. And then you go to bow and then you come back up, you recite Surah Al-Fatiha again, and then more Quran, which should be long but shorter than the last one. And then you go down into sujood again, you do sajda twice, and then you continue with the rest of the prayer and end off as normal. So technically, it's two rakah. It's like fajr. Two rakah. Except this one is very long with the longest standing. One hadith says that it had the longest standing, the longest bowing, and the longest prostrating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it should be very lengthy. You should recite basically as much as possible. And in these two rakah, the entire prayer consists of four times you bow and four times you prostrate your head to Allah. The Prophet, peace be upon him, also encouraged to give charity during this time, to ask Allah to forgive you to invoke Allah and to remember Him and to pray when you see an eclipse happen. And he said that an eclipse is a sign from Allah. It's a sign to make us fearful, to make us scared, to frighten us and remind us that that there's no strength or might except for Allah alone. And to remind us that we have no power and that we need to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And two different narrations, one of Umar radiallahu anhu and one of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu that uh, Ibn Kathir mentions in his tafsir of Surah al 
Yusra verse 59, he says that both of these companions at different points in time, when there was an earthquake, they both turned to the people and basically said that they've become heedless and that they need to straighten up, that they need to fix themselves and that they've basically in one way, shape or form moved off the straight path for whatever reason and that they need to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before Allah punishes them and takes them to account. So solar eclipses are not a random event and solar eclipses are not meaningless. They're meant to strike us with fear and make us fearful of Allah, to remind us of Him, to remind us of the day of judgment. And like I mentioned, the Prophet peace be upon him in one narration, when this eclipse happened, he became fearful that it might be the day of judgment starting. May Allah protect us and grant us the best of this life and the best of the next and forgive us. Allahumma ameen. So although it's very interesting that it's taking place during Ramadan in the last 10 days, potentially even the day following Laylatul Qadr, we can't ascribe any more meaning to it. We can't say, oh, this, this means that now there's going to be some kind of punishment or that it's happening in North America, so God's going to wipe off North America. If Allah wills to, he, okay, He will. But we can't say that because the sun and the moon are eclipsing. Let me ask you a question. If you think this, how is this any different from astrology? In astrology, which is a form of witchcraft, which the Prophet, peace be upon him, said is haram and forbidden. In astrology, people will look at the stars and the sun and the moon and they'll look at the formation of them and say, because they're formed like this, something good is going to happen or this is going to happen, that's going to happen, something bad is going to happen. So how is it any different when we see an eclipse happening and we say, oh, this means something bad is going to happen. A'udhu Billah. If Allah wills something good to happen, it will happen. If Allah wills something bad to happen, it will happen. And the eclipse is only meant to strike us with fear to make us remember Him. That's it. We can't ascribe anything more to it. And Allah SWT knows best. The reason people are becoming very worried about this is not just because it's taking place during Ramadan, but because it seems to be happening very close to the time of the red heifer sacrifice. Which if you don't know, the red heifer sacrifice is something that's being done in Israel by the Jewish people because they believe it'll bring about their Messiah or the, the end times. And Christians are backing this because apparently they believe the same thing. Now, how should we see this as Muslims? Well, firstly, we have to talk about what this sacrifice even is to begin with and what it constitutes. The Temple Institute writes a lot about it and they have an entire website where they outline the entire process and it is disgusting. So they believe this tradition, tradition, was first done by Musa, by Moses, peace and blessings be upon him. And they believe that he did this on the second of what they call the month of Nisan, which is one of the months in their calendar. They also follow a lunar calendar like Muslims, by the way. And the second of Nisan is April 10th, which is the first day of Eid, the first day after Ramadan, when the shayateen are finally released. The shayateen are chained up during Ramadan and they're finally unchained after Ramadan ends. So the first day the shayateen are free is when they supposedly are going to do this ceremony, which is Eid for us, the day of Eid. Furthermore, they say they want to do this before the Passover and the Jewish Passover is April 22nd. So it will be taking place if they do it and if Allah wills, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, it will take place uh, sometime after Ramadan in the month of April. Obviously, they could not do this ceremony during Ramadan because the shayateen are locked up. So they take their chance right away. The red heifer sacrifice seems to be a demonic black magic alteration of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded Moses and the children of Israel to do. And it's narrated in Surah Al-Baqarah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells Musa to go to his people and command them to slaughter a cow. And in their own arrogance and skepticism, they kept demanding more instructions. What kind of cow? What should it look like? And they kept asking for more specific conditions. And Allah gave it to them, making their task harder and harder. The first is that it cannot be too old and it cannot be too young. Secondly, it must be a bright yellow color, not red, bright yellow, pleasing to the eye and it should have never been used to till the soil or to water the field. So basically not to do any physical labor and it must be wholesome without any blemish. This is what Allah told them to do with the yellow heifer or the yellow cow. By the way, the difference between a heifer and a cow is they're both female cows, but a heifer has never gotten pregnant and given birth and a cow has given birth or has gotten pregnant before. Now, what the Jews believe is that the red heifer has to be red perfect in its redness. That it must be between three to four years old, or it could be older, but ideally three to four years old, and at least in its third year of life, never used for physical labor, never given birth, and free from any kind of internal or external defect or blemish. So very similar, but some changes. And the ritual itself is even worse. Like this, this screams black magic like nothing else, a'udhu billah. 
It says the priest must stand on top of the altar and slaughter the heifer. He uses his right hand for the act, and then he gathers its blood, not in a vessel, in his left hand. And then with his right index finger, he sprinkles blood from it seven times, basically on the temple or in the temple. And he's supposed to stand opposite to the entrance of the temple, like he's like making room for all the shayateen to come in, a'udhu billah. And then he descends from the altar and he lights a fire. And then the heifer, the cow, after being slaughtered, is placed on the fire to be burnt. Then he takes three ingredients. This is where it gets even worse. He takes three ingredients, cedar wood, hyssop, and wool dyed with scarlet, dyed red. This is straight like some Salem witchcraft stuff, a'udhu billah. And it only gets worse. Then the priest looks to the crowd of people and he says, this cedar, he asks, this cedar, this cedar, this cedar. And they all say, yes, yes, yes. Then he asks, this hyssop, this hyssop, this hyssop. And they say, yes, yes, yes. And then he asks, this crimson dye, this crimson dye, this crimson dye. And they all say, yes, yes, yes. What on earth is this? And then while the cow is burning, while it's being burnt, before it's fully burnt, he throws it in the fire. A'udhu billah. He throws it in the fire with it to burn. And then when the fire is finished and everything's completely burnt and all that's left is basically like a, a pile of like a black mass, they beat it with rods and they sift it so it becomes ashes. And then these ashes are saved for purity. They divide them into three categories. One is just kept sitting on the altar in case they do it again. Another one is put in front of the women's court because I believe the men and women are separated. And the last third is given to the priests involved so they can basically spread it to their community and purify their community. All of this information is from the Temple Institute's website and you can go check it out and read it for yourself right now if you want. And towards the end, they say, all the people who are involved with the heifer and its preparation from beginning to end become impure from contact with it. And then they say, and it is this concept that the pure, the priests, are rendered impure by the very same agent which brings purity to others who are lacking it. That is the mystery of the commandment, beyond the grasps of all understanding, for this is a profound paradox that the same instrument can have opposite effects. Astaghfirullah This is clear black magic. This is clear like lunacy. And anyone who is involved with black magic, anyone who does black magic will be thrown in the hellfire. They are disbelievers and Allah SWT will punish them unless they turn and repent and amend their ways. It seems like shaitan, for some reason, loves that which Allah SWT does not love. So, you know, offing innocent people, blood, the horrible things I can't say in this video right now. Shaitan, it seems like he gets people to do them and then he'll do things for these people because they're engaging in such evil conduct. And in this case specifically, it seems like he took something that Allah commanded Musa salam to do and he demonized it. He made a demonic thing and now he's making people do this demonic ritual in order to, I don't know, grant them some kind of uh, further evil that he will work with them in whatever way because they're doing this kind of stuff. A'udhu billah, regardless of what it is, we need to stay away from it. And and on top of that, it's nothing really like special. Like they work with the jinn, they work with the shayateen, but the shayateen and the people can't do anything unless Allah wills them to. They believe that it's going to be the Messiah that conducts this on April 2nd. We don't believe that the Dajjal will come out basically on April 2nd for whatever reason. We believe according to Islamic eschatology and what the Prophet peace be upon him said that the Imam Mahdi will come out and he will be at a war for many years and he will rule for seven years. And while he is here amongst the people, People in ruling, that's when the Dajjal will come out and that's where Isa alayhi salam will come out as well and then everything will take place. Mahdi hasn't come out, the gold has not appeared and there are multiple signs that are supposed to take place before the Dajjal comes which they think will be their Messiah. It's demonic and it's evil and as Muslims we should detest it because it's disgusting, may Allah protect us, but it really doesn't mean much. So Muslims should not be getting overhyped over these signs. The Prophet peace and blessings be upon him gave us many minor and major signs of the day of judgment coming. The first of which was him coming Coming and him passing away sallallahu alaihi wasallam and since he gave us many signs we don't have to look anywhere else we see them happening we see them occurring we know we're basically in the end times already and it could be in our lifetime in our kids lifetime or many lifetimes in the future but regardless it is very close and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow it to happen when he wills alone and no amount of black magic no amount of sacrifices no amount of eclipses will uh, force us to believe that okay it's going to happen at this point in time no one knows except Allah and that's something that the prophet peace be upon him emphasized and something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself emphasized a lot in the Quran. Something we should take note of and something we should take heed in is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends these signs for us to bring us closer to him and to remind us of the day of judgment. The Prophet peace be upon him many times 
would cry and weep and become scared and worried about the day of judgment, including with the eclipse. And in one case in particular, the angel in charge of blowing the trumpet on the day of judgment, Prophet he said that he was commanded to get ready. So he basically like got ready. Imagine like standing one foot in front of the other, getting in position. He took a breath, a deep breath, and he put the trumpet to his mouth. And he's basically waiting for Allah to give him the command to blow the trumpet and start the day of judgment. That is not a light issue. That is scary. That is serious. And I am scared and you should be scared. We should be fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and get our act together for His sake alone. You need to do dhikr of Allah. You need to pray your prayers on time. One thing I've been using since I was 16 is the Adhan app. You can download the Adhan app using the link in the description. It will remind you of when to pray, give you adhkar, remind you to seek forgiveness and give you many, many different tools that you need as a Muslim day to day. Islamic eschatology and the signs of the end are very, very specific and very interesting and important to learn about. So if you guys want, I will do an entire series on the end times with the Mahdi, with the Dajjal, with Isa alayhi salam, with Ya'juj, Ma'juj, and all the minor and major signs that will come and take place inshallah. If you guys want to see that, let me know and I will do that. But for now, do not be scared of any man-made event like the sacrifice and only be fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't allow yourself to become worried that, oh, this bad thing is going to happen because the stars and the sun and the moon and a'udhu billah because this is astrology and this is witchcraft and it is forbidden. And the same people, by the way, who are doing the sacrifice on April 2nd might be looking at the eclipse as some kind of sign because they're engaged in witchcraft themselves. Astaghfirullah So don't fall into that. May Allah protect us and keep us firm on his deen. May Allah forgive me if I said anything that is incorrect and reward you guys and me for any of our good deeds and accept our fasting. Allahumma ameen. With that being said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.